Hey everybody, welcome back to the Convo Couch. I am Fiorella Isabel and I am here today with Joshua Collins who's running for Congress in Washington's Congressional District 10. Hi Joshua, thank you for being here. Hi Fiorella, have, thanks for having me. Thanks so much. So uh, let's get to it. You are running in... The 10th District. And what, what, uh, what counties does that encompass? Well, over half of it is in Pierce County. Um, it basically includes Eastside Tacoma and the greater Pierce County area, which is like Puyallup, Lakewood, um, the JBLM, the entire uh, military base. Um, then it also has uh, most of Thurston County and a little bit of Mason County. And tell me what is some, what are some of the pressing issues in your area, but also what is like the one issue that you are paying most attention to as a uh, leftist progressive candidate running? Well, um, the, some of the top issues are the water quality. You know, we have an issue of the water being poisoned uh, in Lakewood from, you know, fire retardants running off from the military base, which is in the district. Um, water quality in general um, is an issue. Um, you know, we've had problems in my neighborhood as well. Um, the other top issues, um, you know, healthcare is pretty big, um, but I would say by far the number one issue is housing. Um, you know, housing has just been getting more and more expensive. Homelessness has been increasing. Um, and just people's inability to pay for their housing has just been getting more and more difficult. So. so you're not running as a Democrat anymore. Can you explain to me and uh, to our audience, what is the Essential Workers Party and why you decided to go that route? Yeah. So um, I was running as a Democrat originally. And uh, under the conditions I was running, it made the most sense. There was initially just the incumbent Democrat, and it is a uh, slightly blue district, um, and I intended to knock off the incumbent. Now, he retired. Um, now, that in alone wasn't the reason I changed to third party, um, but we ended up in the most crowded primary in recent modern history uh, in Washington state. There are 19 candidates running, and it is a jungle primary, which means we're all on the same ballot and competing for the top two positions, right? The top two vote getters are the ones who advance the general from any party, right? Um, we were looking at the fact that there are eight Democrats, eight Republicans, and uh, you know, one independent and one like not serious guy that's also a fascist, um, and. We tried a bunch of different ballot lines. You know, I heavily considered um, running on the Green Party ballot line, on the Socialist Alternative ballot line. Um, you know, but we tested a lot of different um, lines with the voters and the people in the district. And uh, when we tried the Essential Workers Party as the ballot line, um, it was really well received. Um, you know, it, a lot of people who are very deep in politics were skeptical of it, um, but with the average worker in the district, um, it's very popular. I mean, they really like uh, what they, like when they hear it, they're very interested and they, um, and the most important thing about the essential workers party ballot line is they know what it means. They know what it stands for. The second they see it, they know this person is for the workers. And uh, whether they are an essential worker or an un unemployed worker, they're at least interested enough to look into me as a candidate. Um, now in Washington state, uh, we also have a voters pamphlet. Um, and for those who don't know what it is, it's a pamphlet that goes out to every single registered voter in the entire district. And over half of our voters make the decision based on this pamphlet. Um, now, they will be reading uh, between eight Democrats and eight Republicans who all basically sound the same. And then one person who says, essential workers party. Um, now I'm trying to form this party as a coalition party. Um, you know, I do have support from, from Socialist Alternative and from other third parties in Washington state. Um, and we are uh, trying to actually form a coalition party successfully on the national level. Um, now in Washington state, it's very easy to get ballot access. Um, you essentially just have to get it as a, a single candidate. Um, now, because of the conditions that we're running in, um, I'm a viable candidate, and this is uh, an unusual situation to find yourself in, where um, I had the option of continuing to run as a Democrat and just be another Democrat to a lot of people who have never heard of me. Um, we can't knock doors, you know. We are phone banking constantly, um, but I think that this is the thing that you know we needed to do to appeal to uh, a lot of non-voters, um, which in the lowest voter turnout district in the state uh, is a pretty big deal. Um, and also to appeal to um, more independent leaning Republicans and Democrats. Um, we needed to stand out and we needed to 
send a message to people that maybe uh, all they read about me is my voters pamphlet guide um, and let them know what I stand for. Um, now, if I get elected as the Essential Workers Party candidate, um, you know, I will be going into Congress with a mandate for multiple issues for both essential workers and unemployed people right now. So, um, so you would be on the ballot? Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, um, to get ballot access in Washington State, you either have to get, um, I think it's, what is it, 100 se or 1,700 signatures or something like that, which really means you have to get thousands just to, to get on. Now we couldn't do that this cycle because of the pandemic, um, or you have to pay the, the fee. Um, so we ended up having to pay that. Um, and you are able to put whatever you'd like on the ballot. Um, and we made this decision based on the popularity of the name um, and how it was received, not by you know Democrats and people who are super involved in politics, but the non-voters, the people who typically don't pay too much attention, the more um, disengaged voters. So you're going after non-voters instead of the usual trend of going after yes would be voters. Which is, I think, yes. And I think that's our only path to victory anyway. Um, you know, in the lowest voter turnout district with eight Democrats, um, we were deciding between trying to get the biggest slice of that Democratic vote. And there are a lot of voters in, in Washington state who just flat out won't vote Democrat. Um, but there are a lot of people who do vote third party. Um, you know, as many people know, uh, Shama Sawant, uh, very well known around the world as an elected third party socialist, ran in Seattle and won that election under the socialist alternative title, right? Um, now, I am a socialist alternative member, um, but we decided this would be something that would be more viable in my district, which is, uh, a lot less aware of the term socialism and uh, generally just understands what an essential worker is and what issues that I stand for. And the second they see my policies, they like them. So. so do you think it is a waste of time to run under a democratic ticket? Because what happens is a lot of the time we see members like AOC, uh, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar have a really hard time opposing people like Nancy Pelosi because they have to pretty much play ball in order to get into some of the committees and stuff. Do you think it's a waste of time? I mean, it's just so hard. like, why are we voting progressives in if they're going to have to play ball within the Democratic Party? I, I just I don't know if I see the party being able to be reformed at this point. Yeah, I genuinely don't believe that the Democratic Party is going to be reformed. I mean, we can see just what they did on the presidential level, what they've done with congressional races nationwide. Um, I do understand running as a Democrat. I mean, I, I was initially running as a Democrat. Um, and for a lot of people, it is the most uh, rational way to get elected. Um, and initially in my race, it made me most likely to get elected. And it's the reason the incumbent dropped out because I was a threat to him. Um, but you know, in Washington state, we have a real opportunity to succeed with third party politics. And we have had success with third party politics in Washington state. Um, you know, ballot access is not an issue. You don't have to worry about going into a general with one Democrat and one Republican. Um, I'm running against 18 other candidates and I need a plurality. I need the top two. Um, and in a race like this, such a crowded primary, our win number could be as low as 25,000 votes. Um, uh, and we're hoping that, you know, because of the work we've been doing, the number of doors we, we knocked before the pandemic and the hundreds of thousands of phone uh, calls, phone calls we've made with our phone bankers, um, uh, along with, you know, a very effective mailer and an email program and social media that we can squeak out a win here. Um, and based on, you know, what we've seen so far, it looks likely that we will make it through. Um, and if we make it through the primary, I strongly believe that we will win the general election. Yeah, that would be unprecedented. I mean, this is a brand new thing, especially during coronavirus. Um, oh, but as far as, um, I can actually talk about this real quick. Yeah. Um, I never intended to stay as a Democrat. Now, I never talked about this publicly, but people who knew me and worked within my campaign knew that I was not going to stay a Democrat if elected as a Democrat. I never intended to. Um, and the thing that I learned about the Democratic Party is... If you're a regular working person, you're an outsider. It doesn't matter how much time you spend in their spaces. I went to, geez, like over 100 meetings just for the Democratic Party. You know, 
every single LD in the district. I went to their meetings. Um, you know, I had some days where I was going to three different uh, chapters of the Democratic Party meetings in a day. Um, with all of that work, with all that time spent in their space, meeting them, talking to them, trying to convince the, these you know, older folks running these Democratic Party organizations, I got almost nowhere. The people who supported me already supported me, and uh, I was treated like an outsider. Whereas these um, politicians that are now running in my race, people who are, uh, you know, an ex-mayor, um, a sitting uh, state rep, um, they were treated like they were legitimate Democrats, and I was treated like not a real Democrat. Um, the media also treated me that way. I, um, I, as long as other socialists running as Democrats in Washington State, didn't get any wasn't going to get any endorsements from the LDs, the legislative district, the Democratic chapters. Um, and I was smeared endlessly by members of leadership and just the treatment that I, as a working class person, as a truck driver who lives in the district, who uh, you know works in the district, I've been to, <laughs> I've delivered freight to all over the state. Um, you know, I've done, uh, I, I'm just a regular person. I was treated like an outsider because I'm not a sitting representative and I'm not part of the establishment. Okay, so I'm just going to go on to the foreign policy because that's um, I, a lot. Of, I feel like a lot of the times candidates don't really talk about that, and I, and it definitely takes a lot of our money away. We just approved uh, billions of dollars for the new defense budget, and um, people don't realize that it's it's all connected. It's all connected, and so what is your opinion right now on the U.S.'s focus back on? Russia and back on and that sort of neo McCarthyism from the 1960s and 50s. Um, I think that the path that we're on uh, with the military industrial complex and with our foreign aggression is something that can only be solved by ending corruption and having people who are hardline anti war and hardline anti imperialist. I would never support any of these military budgets that are, uh, you know, funding war overseas and funding, you know, aggressive uh, base placement uh, in countries that don't want us there, um, and having, you know, a presence in places where, frankly, we shouldn't be, but we are because of corporate interest. Um, I think that. Uh, the average person in America doesn't agree with almost anything our government is doing with our tax dollars, with our with our, our funding, um, and so. I'm opposing all of it. I'm opposing us being in all of these countries, um, and I think that is the right stance. I think based on you know how military members feel as well, they also don't want us to be in these countries. They also want us to be dealing with problems that we uh, we have structures in place to actually deal with. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is supposed to deal with things like our poisoned water, but yet we have a really bad water system where you can go almost anywhere in the country and you probably find contaminants, especially if you're in a working class or um, you know, a, a non-white area, you're probably gonna find contaminants in the water. Now we have a, a part of our military that's supposed to fix that, but they don't. And I think most people in this country would agree that that is a, the result of a, of a corrupt and flawed system. Yeah, it seems we're so focused on um, other countries and what they're doing to us without cleaning up our own house first. And uh, one of the most tumultuous conflicts that we have, especially within the progressive community that is divisive for a lot of people, is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Right now, um, we uh, we give so much money to Israel and the military, and they continue to enact acts of, you know, just in, inhumane acts on, on Palestinians, but of course, there's the, the two-state solution and then there's this BDS. Which do you support or if you support anything else and uh, why? Well, um, I, I support BDS. Um, now, I also, um, I, I guess my opinion on uh, Israel and Palestine is I think that they should, um, if, if it's a one-state solution, they should have a universal right to vote. Um, if a two-state solution could be done, I mean, a lot would have to be done in, in order to draw those correctly. A lot of people would have to be removed from these settlements, which I, I don't think, um, you know, too many people would be against it, it, particular Palestinians. But um, the the biggest issue is like Palestinians are treated like second-class citizens in a in you know their country, and you know they a lot of them don't have the right to vote. So they don't have have the right to free movement. They they generally are deprived of basic human rights, um, in, in a way very similar to how like Native Americans were treated, um, you know, in the earlier years of the formation of our country, um, and you know settler colonialism is. Uh, 
it's brutal and it hurts people and people die and people lose their homes and they it breaks apart families and uh, it the impact of it doesn't just last for a few years after you've impacted it lasts for generations so the um, the downfall of this will take serious uh, you know it, it would take serious um, effort in order to repair all the harm that's been done to the Palestinian people um, so I think that's kind of the path that we should be going towards. I certainly don't think we should be continuing to provide funding for the Israeli government to uh, continue you know, bombing <laughs> the Palestinians. Uh, I, at the very least, that's what we should do. Um, you know, at the best, we should also um, encourage you know, the um, establishment of the actual human rights of the Palestinians. And, uh, and whatever solution we can actually uh, come to, I, I, would, I would support the most. So. Do you support the use of pro-democracy groups like NGOs? Because a lot of the times what happens is Americans, we go to other countries and say we're spreading democracy. And uh, that's actually the opposite of what we do. Uh, you can take what's going on in China and you can take what, what we were trying to do in Venezuela with Nicolas Maduro. Do you think he's a brutal dictator and we need to go in there and, and sort of uh, clean house with pro-democracy? <laughs> I, no, I don't think we should be involved in Venezuela at all. Um, I, I mean, we can see what the involvement of the U.S. has had in all over uh, Central and South America. Um, you know, we should not be deciding who the leader is of another nation. It's just, it's not our place. I mean, would we want someone else picking our president for us? I mean, I don't think so. Um, I mean, we already have corporations running our, our president. Uh, I, I don't know. I think, um, you know, I mean, look at Bolivia. I mean, the results of the U.S.-backed coup in Bolivia. I mean, just so many native people, indigenous people, were just brutalized, tortured, in, in prison, and even murdered. Um, because in countries like this, the the like left resistance, the left you know leadership, it's also like indigenous resistance. And in those in those countries, like you're talking about, basically an ethnic cleansing that comes from these. Uh, these events where, um, you know, minorities are targeted and the, well, they're not even minorities in a lot of these countries, but, you know, it, it ends up propping up this white supremacist, like, regimes and then also brutal dictators. I mean, the, when Pinochet uh, got, came into power and, like, all the people who were tortured by his, his regime and murdered and just, uh, you know, the families that were broken apart, the, the amount of refugees it created, I mean, just the amount of crises that it causes when the U.S. gets involved in another nation's affairs is just, uh, I, th I think the um, history and the evidence speaks for itself. We should not be involved in this, both for our own sake, but also for the sake of the people in those countries. What would you su suggest instead then, uh, like a more diplomatic uh, diplomacy that's non-interventionist? Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, and generally just advocacy and support for the human rights of people. I mean, um, but certainly not military intervention. Right, there's a difference. It seems like people don't know the difference. Um, and uh, let, going on to what's happening right now, we're seeing mass protests. We're seeing a lot of people stand up against police brutality. We're seeing um, some of the democratic establishment also try to co-opt that message. What can we do to stop that co-option and how do you feel about Black Lives Matter and, and the marching going on? Um, so I've always supported Black Lives Matter. Um, even before I really considered myself very political, um, you know, I was I was still pretty young when uh, BLM started. Um, I um, today these protests, um, I see them as perfectly valid. I think that you know they're very justified. Um, you know, when you see video of a cop, you know, just suffocating someone to death with their knee or with a chokehold, or shooting someone in the back, or just planting drugs on people. I mean, how can you not be mad? I, I think the uh, the rage is justified. I think that the actions are justified. I think the, that people are doing everything they can to try and see change. And um, I think that a lot of Democratic politicians, which are typically the ones in power in the places where this police brutality is happening, these Democratic politicians want to pass some small reforms and call it a day. And I think people are done with that. Um, a lot of the places where the same reforms that some people are suggesting have been passed are places where, like, recent incidences, incidents have happened where, you know, the reforms didn't solve anything because you, ha you can't 
address an issue that is so deeply rooted in the white supremacist culture uh, of the police and just the uh, militaristic um, culture of the police. Uh, and that's why I think you know we do need to have a more radical approach to fixing our policing system. And what I mean by that is, uh, I mean, defunding the police to a lot of people sounds sounds radical. But when you actually get into like what it means to defund the police, um, it means a lot of the problems that cannot be solved by a cop with a gun who's out here to you know shoot someone, act like a like a soldier. Um, you need someone else. I mean, I've had a lot of situations in my life where um, I can't call the cops. You know, I have someone who is having a mental breakdown or something, and I'm afraid that the cops are going to come and shoot my, um, you know. Uh, family member with a mental illness. Um, you know, in those situations, I need a social worker. In some other situations, I need an EMT. Um, and you know, when all you have is a hammer and you just keep giving more funding to that hammer, <laughs> um, everything looks like a nail. And I think um, that's why we need to, we do need to defund the police, and we need to spend that money on other things that actually solve the problems in our society. Uh, another perfect example for a lot of people who don't know and don't know what happens in democratic cities like the one I live in. Um, you have homeless encampments, right? What are the what are the reasons that a homeless encampment exists? Because housing is expensive. Because there aren't shelters. There's no public housing. Um, and instead of addressing the root causes of that, what our city does, and what democratic cities all over the country do, is they send cops in. They use cops as the solution to a homeless encampment. And so they send cops in to go in and you know rip people out of their tents. They take all of their belongings, everything wheelchairs, walkers, medication, anything, and their tents, their sleeping bags, their clothes, you know, anything that they need, band-aids, um, you know, a picture of their mother, like all of it, throw everything away. And they, anyone who doesn't leave willingly is arrested. Um, and I mean, constitutionally, like the Supreme Court has decided they're supposed to secure housing for the people that they're, uh, you know, sweeping, right? But they don't. They just flat out don't listen. Why? Because police are unaccountable in this country. And so I don't think it's rational to continue using cops to try to solve all of our society's problem. It doesn't work. It's not, it's not morally or fiscally responsible. It just it makes no sense. So. Well, police are protecting property and, and the people that are living in houses, not necessarily the people outside. They're a nuisance uh, to, to that. Um, how do we get this movement of of police brutality and, and defunding the police, which is a great movement because I've started seeing a lot of the, the focus shift a little bit towards economics because obviously minorities, especially black people, suffer the economics of it. I mean, they, they earn less than a white person, even, even a person that is black and has college makes less than a, a white person that doesn't have college. So how do we shift this movement right now? Because we are in the middle of a pandemic. We're on the precipice of economic collapse. How do we take this to the next level, which is like a general strike where we start talking about, you know, a UBI, where we start talking about Medicare for all, where we start talking about a list of demands? Um, so a, a lot of people, um, I mean, I mean, it's a lot of it's kind of like muddied, but um, MLK's movement wasn't just a movement for like civil rights; it was a movement for the economic rights of people. I mean, MLK was a was a, a democratic socialist. Like this guy wanted uh, you know healthcare for all. He supported you know federal rent control, uh, a living stipend for people, uh, which was a UBI, um, and all kinds of other things that you know today is treated as radical left policies, but. MLK also believed in a lot of those things. And, um, and the reason that there was so much success with the civil rights movement is because they were not just fighting for, uh, for um, black issues and for black civil rights, but they were also fighting for workers in general. And if you look at the marches um, you know, uh, during the MLK civil rights movement, um, you'll see signs scattered throughout every single protest for trade unions, for um, LGBTQ issues, um, for you know, immigration issues, and all kinds of other issues that are generally thought of, uh, as having been separate from this and excluded from it, but they really weren't. He built an amazing coalition, um, and th the people at the time had formed a giant coalition that was, was representing the needs of all oppressed people in this country. And I think that's what we're seeing today. I mean, I have been to all these, I I've been to so many of these protests and like heard so many speeches, and 
I mean, it's right there. I mean, the economics is already being included in the movement. People are already saying that we also need things like federal rent control, like guaranteed, um, you know, a housing guarantee, a federal jobs guarantee, um, you know, erasing student debt. I mean, these things are already being included in the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so I think um, what we need to do in order for it to succeed is just continue showing up, continue uh, building on it, um, continue speaking out aggressively um, against uh, any suggestion of moderate reforms and continue demanding more to demand the whole loaf, not the crumbs, right? I mean, that's just, that's what we need to be doing. Um, I, I can see um, how this could uh, turn into a general strike, but in order for that to happen, um, we would need to be much more organized and that means building up mutual aid systems. Um, you know, you can't do a mutual, uh, a general strike unless you can support the people striking, which means we need to start um, thinking uh, of like how and, and organizing to actually be able to support workers who were to strike for other rights. Because while a general strike is illegal, uh, illegal strikes happen all the time in this country. And I think that's what we're gonna have to do. We're going to have to organize and be ready to go up against um, you know, media that doesn't support us and just frankly the financial difficulties that those workers are gonna um, suffer under and just be ready to support each other during this. And I think that's kind of what uh, we're building right now. I've, I'm seeing mutual aid be, become a more and more common thing in my community um, and communities on the country, and I think that's uh, what, what it's going to take for us to build a general strike or, or some sort of movement similar. So. And just to clarify, mutual aid, you mean like financial help for the people striking, correct? Because if they're not going to be working, they need to live in some way. Yeah, um, you know, food, um, you know, uh, child care, like... Uh, housing, obviously, and making sure that if a worker is striking, that their community is behind them. For every one person who, you know, uh, walks off the job in solidarity with the movement, you need three people supporting them. And uh, that's how general strikes have succeeded in the past in other countries. Um, and I think that's what we need here, is we need to have this these, these systems of mutual aid kind of already built. Um, and uh, we're, we're pretty far from that, but I think we're actually going in the right direction. And we've made a lot of progress in a very short amount of time, um, mostly because of the pandemic, uh, unfortunately. But, um, but I, I think that, that um, the conditions that are being created are going to make it more likely, more possible for us to do, not only uh, start a, a general strike or something like that, but to actually succeed and to actually support people so they're not just going on strike and then just becoming homeless, which, yeah, we wouldn't. Yeah. Which tends to happen. And um, we have seen how in 2016 Bernie Sanders suffered, not just from the, the mainstream media blackout, but also from the uh, establishment pretty much suppressing the vote, suppressing people's votes. And we saw evidence of election fraud uh, back in, now in 2020 or forward in 2020. We're see, we saw the same thing, the whole establishment come together against him, again with the media maligning him this time more. And of course, the exit polls weren't matching. We saw a lot of voter suppression yet again. What is the point of voting and how do you get people to vote um, if, if our elections don't have integrity, our elections aren't fair. We talk about elections in Venezuela, but they're, they have some of the best elections and we can't get our elections together. We're blaming Russia. What can we do about, uh, how do we get election integrity? Because I feel like if a lot of people just don't focus on it and they, th they continue talking about, oh, who are we gonna run in 2024 under the democratic ticket? You know, as much as I love Nina Turner, it's like, that doesn't really solve our problems. So how do we get, election reform and how do we get people to really have faith in a system that, especially for young people, uh, Gen Z, it's shown them time and time again that their vote doesn't count. Yeah. Uh, I mean, think, I think the number one thing we need to do is start uh, demanding that people like Bernie Sanders address it. I mean, I, I do feel like uh, not only his election, but other uh, you know leftists running as Democrats were also like they also had their elections stolen. I mean, um, there was the what was her name the the um, uh, like county uh, prosecutor that ran in uh, in New York. Um, Ooh, uh, you're talking about Dalazar uh, or. No, no, no. 
But there, there was, I can't remember her name at the moment, but she ran for county prosecutor and her election was basically stolen. And I mean, what happened with Charles Booker where it looks like it, it was stolen. I mean, how, do, how does a guy lose votes? I mean, this stuff is happening all over the country and uh, we need to start uh, you know, acknowledging that our elections might be getting rigged around the country, particularly in states where you have closed Democratic primaries, where only Democrats can vote for Democrats. Um, fortunately, I live in Washington State. Um, I think we should model a lot of uh, the country off of our system. Um, we have uh, online registration. We have automatic registration. Anytime you interact with a government like office, you have to register to vote. Um, we also have a 100% mail-in ballot system, which means when you register to vote, you get mailed a ballot and you get 18 days to return it. Um, and if those ballots are flawed, um, you can uh, like have volunteers go and like chase them out and you know, someone will knock on your door and be like, is this your, you know, your ballot? And then you can sign off that it's your ballot. I mean, and that's called curing a ballot. I mean, we have a really good system. You, you can verify your vote online. Um, I think we should have a lot of the country, um, you know, modeled after after our system as far as like election security. I mean, we have paper ballots, so every everything is like documented. You can verify it, like online voter ver voter verification. Um, but on top of that, you know, we also need public financing of elections. Um, you know, I, but I mean, I guess going back to that uh, the original question, how we actually solve this on a national level um, is calling it out. I mean. A lot of the reason they get away with this is because people don't know it's happening or people in power are unwilling to acknowledge that it's happening. I mean, I was paying really close attention to Bernie's election in 2016. You know, I voted for him and, uh, and my vote didn't count then. Like, it just flat out didn't. Um, and I lived in Nevada at the time, uh, during the primary at least. And if you remember what happened in Nevada, entire precincts were wiped out over the the state like messing with people's voter registrations. I mean, that alone, it's criminal and they got away with it. Like Bernie never talked about it. I mean, no one no one in power really talked about it. I mean, maybe Trump did a little bit, but that's for his own gain. And I, I think what it takes is for people like AOC, people like Elon Omar to be constantly just railing against these and, and bringing, like shining a spotlight on it, bringing attention to it so that the rest of the country is out, is as outraged as these small percentage of us who even know what's happening, so. Okay, and just like a last question before closing out. Um, you, we've, you, you mentioned Shama Zawant. She's able to really organize really well on the ground and then take that into the electorate. Even though it's city council, she's able to make things happen via legislation using the people. I don't really see that in Congress. What's to stop you or what's to, yeah, stop you from really playing ball once you get into Congress? What are you going to do differently that members of the, 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 the squad haven't really been able to do? Um, I would much more publicly and openly be um, antagonistic at the very least, very oppositional to uh, people like Nancy Pelosi. Uh, you wouldn't see me in any smiling photos with Nancy Pelosi. I, like, in, no offense to the people who you know are working within the system, but um, that's just not me. I wouldn't be, uh, you know, going along to get along. I would be fighting for the issues that I, I, I believe in, and uh, if someone doesn't support them, I would call them out publicly for it, like all of them. I mean, there's hundreds of people in Congress who are being passed as, you know, good progressive Democrats, and they're just not. They're not people who stand with working people. They're people who choose their donors and then choose workers just enough to stay in office. And so I, I, would, I would be... <laughs> I'd be causing some trouble, uh, to say the least. Um, but I, I would also be modeling, uh, you know, what I do, very similar to Shama Sawant. Um, Shama Sawant, if you don't know, is, has endorsed me, so is Socialist Alternative. Um, they've been great help for my election in general. Um, you know, obviously we're not canvassing, but um, you know, they've they've been a huge help. And I I just got to say, like, what Shama did can be done at the federal level, but it requires someone to actually go out and do it. I, I don't know, like, and. For those who don't know, she didn't get elected as a Democrat. She didn't then change her affiliation. She was elected as a third party at a at a particular moment where, like, it, it was just the right time for that election. And it was a it was a pretty big election. Seattle elections are com comparable to congressional races, particularly when they're uh, citywide elections. Um, 
And she won um, in part uh, due to the fight for 15. Um, it was a very big issue at the time for Seattle. Um, you know, Tacoma had one of the highest minimum wages in the state, and Seattle um, it itself was like ready for a higher minimum wage. And, you know, you've got two of the richest people on the planet living in Seattle, uh, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, right? And they still don't have living wages. And you know, Shuma got elected in part because she was championing this, you know. Uh, radical policy of a $15 minimum wage and because she and she was a socialist and you know she helped you know, popularize the idea of a socialist and like and she also changed the the face of politics in Seattle uh, Washington state as well I mean in general I mean when when you mention Shama's name in Olympia like everyone knows who she is they know the uh, strength of the movement she is, is a part of and they know that like if she is fighting for an issue she's fighting to block a bill in the state legislature um, they are afraid of her <laughs> and I and I think that's what needs to happen you know on, on the congressional level um, if if I were to get elected I would go into Congress with a mandate and I would use my uh, my microphone my platform to fight for the things I want and against the things I think just shouldn't happen in Congress. Um, I would be openly calling people corrupt for passing these uh, giant military budgets. I mean, what else is it? Like, and that's what I would be saying. I wouldn't be, you know, saying, "Oh, we disagree on, you know, whether or not these things are right." No, um, it's not that we disagree. It's that these people are paid to agree with that, and it's just flat out corruption. And I would, I would be very vocal about that. And I think. Uh, and I know this sounds like you know uh, uh, very far ahead, but I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about you know what the relationship would be between me and the Democrats in Congress if I were elected. And I think um, I think people would be surprised how much impact I would have for getting, if I got elected. So, as as the Zoomers have really taken into you, and you use a lot of TikTok, I know. What what can you tell them? Um, what would you want to tell them to, to like get involved? Because a lot of them are apathetic. I talk to a lot of young people. My sister's 17. They just don't feel like any change can happen. What have you found is, is a good way to reach uh, younger voters? Well, um, I mean, to reach younger voters, I mean, social media is the easiest way, obviously, um, but also being left in general, not just on economic issues, but social issues. Um, I'm... I'm not just progressive on economics. Uh, I'm very progressive on social issues. I mean, uh, one of the things that's gotten me the most attention from Zoomers is actually my trans rights platform. Um, so I, I've, um, I cover a lot of issues that you know a lot of people on the left maybe don't spend a lot of focus on. But if you're a trans Zoomer, you really care about the, your politician, you know, pushing for trans rights issues. Um, as far as like what I would say to Zoomers watching uh, this, and like what should you be doing if you feel powerless within the electoral system? There is organizing you can do um, that doesn't require you to build an entire congressional campaign and build a movement, right? And I, I've learned this stuff more recently as, as I'm running for office. I'm, um, you can unionize your workplace. I mean, if you're working at a subway and you have four coworkers, you only have to convince two of them to unionize. You just need a simple majority. Um, I recommend you know looking into the IWW um, and seeing if they're a good fit for you. Um, but organizing your workplace is one of the quickest way you can get gains, uh, in, you know, economically. Um, and it it takes um, a little bit of uh, of a risk, but um, these are the type of things that can that have and will get you gains. Uh, more immediately um, and, and improve your life and the life of uh, you know, your coworkers. There are also other ways you can organize. Um, mutual aid collectives uh, are generally um, all over the country. You can work with them to you know, help people in your community. Um, you can organize with uh, other you know, non-electoral movements like ballot initiatives, um, as well as tenants unions. You can form a tenants union, um, particularly if you live in like a, an apartment complex that is uh, less than desirable. Those are really good places to form tenants unions, and um, you know we have a lot of like slum apartment complexes in in my district in particular who are forming tenants unions during this pandemic, and, and actually getting uh, improved quality and uh, you know of their buildings because they're organizing right now. Um, now all of these are things that you can do uh, without having to run for Congress. You know, running for Congress just makes it easier for me to help with those things, and I think um, you know. 
if you're interested in organizing, um, you know, kind of look at all of these different paths between electoral and non-electoral and kind of figure out what's best for you and what you think you'd be best at and, um, and also what you and the people in your community need the most. That's what I would say. So. Where can we find you and uh, give us your website and donation link? Yeah, uh, my website's joshua2020.com. Um, we take all our donations donations on CrowdPack. Um, you know, we used them before we used ActBlue. We no longer use ActBlue. Um, and so, yeah, joshua2020.com. We have some phone banking events that will be coming up. So if you sign up to volunteers, you, volunteer, you'll get, um, you know, information about that. Um, we also do just basically daily phone banking, but we have, like, major events coming up. Um, you know, if you can donate anything, uh, anything helps. Um, you know, we only need, um, you know, probably twenty thousand dollars more to basically cover all of our expenses for this election. So, uh, and, and we're getting an average of fifteen dollars uh, per donation. So, you know, anything you can give would, would really help. So, all right, Joshua, thank you so much for this interview. Appreciate it.